We have a lively crowd this morning. Tell uh, everybody was enjoying visiting a little bit there. Um, so good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Ron Kilbaugh. I am one of the uh, Art Valley Future Board members, as well as the Director of Economic and Business Development for the Schlein Declaration Regional Board of Board. So it's, it's really great to see uh, so many of you here today to learn more about uh, the implementation phase of the Art Valley Air Future Action Plan and what your role as either a lead or a supporting partner is going to be in that and uh, also uh, to learn more about how you can utilize uh, Art Valley Air Future to support all the things you can do. So during our first hour this morning, um, we're going to have several presenters that are going to lead you through that information and then uh, we also are leaving some time so that you can give our Valley Air Future some feedback on what the organization can do better. Uh, during the second hour, uh, we're going to devote that to breakout sessions, and uh, that will be for the lead and supporting partners of the Game Changer initiatives. Uh, so if you're not a lead or a supporting partner, you're going to get to go around 10 o'clock. Uh, if you are a lead or supporting partner, well, you get to stick around with us a little bit longer. Um, so. I think uh, thinking about today and, and what we're doing and, and looking at our past action plan, I think one of the great things that we have about the OBUF action plans is that it, it's got teeth. And, and what I mean by that is all too often communities will get together and they'll develop this great plan and, and this vision for the future. And then when they're all done with it, it ends up being set on a shelf. And one of the reasons it ends up on the shelf is they never really brought together different organizations and teams and, and really set champions in, uh, in place to move their plans forward. And I guess, to put it a little more succinctly, they just never put action to their action plan. And so, I think uh, looking at all of you here today, I know that that's not going to be the case. This plan won't just be sitting on the shelf. And I am really confident that we're going to do some great things for the next few years for our community. Uh, so now uh, I would like to introduce the uh, Our Valley Our Future. Are you ready, Steve? Okay. To introduce Our Valley Our Future's coordinator, Steve Motter, and he's going to go into some more details. Good morning, everybody. And like Ron said, we've got a great turnout today. Um, I'm going to show you a slide in a second. In fact, I'll just pop it up right now. Uh, some of you may have seen this when we released the action plan, but we have about 81 organizations serving as leading supporting partners. And based on last night, we've got about 65 or 66 of you are registered. So um, excellent turnout, really, really good turnout. Um, I also wanted to share this with you just to kind of see again what went into developing the action plan. I mean, there was a lot of work. It took us about uh, 16 months from start to finish. You can see the number of community members who either filled out a survey or participated in a focus group or a listening session of some kind. Uh, and that was all across the region, too. It wasn't just one inch east, one inch. We had excellent representation from the Upper Valley, Chelan, Manson, Waterville, Rock Island, et cetera. Um, and then also the number of hours. There's a lot of time, again, that goes into developing something like this. Um, so the collective impact model is something from the very beginning that our Valley, our future has adhered to. And um, for whatever reason, whenever I think of collective uh, impact, I always think of um, sports teams. Um, doesn't matter what team it is really, but uh, you know, everybody on a sports team has a goal, whether it's to win a championship, win a division title, maybe just get better as a team. And all those players and coaches all have their specific goals Everybody is shooting for that, you know, that big goal, and all those roles are interrelated, and um, and that's pretty much what collective impact is. Uh, and as Ron mentioned a second ago, the fact that you guys are all here today, um, that is collective impact. Um, that we're all in the same room, um, talking about this, moving forward with this plan. Um, I've lived here a fairly long time. I think it's now about 26 years. Um, originally came to work at the Wenatchee World as a reporter, and one of the things that I believe. Um, that is a big characteristic in this community is that people don't live here to be alone. Um, 
Um, and I think our population size itself um, almost ensures that. You know, we still are a community where everybody kind of knows everybody still. Um, we run into each other a lot, and um, my phrase for that is, uh, I call it our, our rate of collision, if you will. Um, you know, we run into each other uh, at youth soccer matches, we see each other on the trails, we see each other in the grocery stores, we see each other um, at church. Um, you know, we know each other either personally or professionally, in some cases both. Um, we know each other, and that's one of the qualities that makes this place really special. In, in, in my opinion. Um, it's also one of the things that make a community-driven action plan possible. Um, you know, if you try to do something that we have done here in a big city, an anonymous city like Seattle, it would never succeed. You wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but because we know each other and we know our organizations and we interact with each other so much, we can do this here. Um, and at the same time, as the action plan, you know, um, reflects is that we've got a lot of tough issues that we're working on. Um, some that have been with us for a while, some that have not. And, uh, you know, we're not alone in that either. There's all kinds of communities around the country um, that are dealing with these issues. Um, you know, it's the sea that we are swimming in right now. The great thing about the OVO action plan um, is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel with all these projects and programs and you know game changer initiatives. We just need to make them a priority, um, make sure that we've got everybody at the table that needs to be at the table, talk and listen to each other, you know, figure out our roles again, the collective impact model, and you know what the game plan is going forward, and then and then act with a I would say a ferocity that this region has always done. You know, we've built dams, we've built railroads, we put orchards in built Mission Ridge, schools, Financial Valley College, on and on and on. We've always done it here. As a side note, uh, I was reading the Cheyenne County PUD newsletter the other day. Kirk Hudson, the new PUD general manager, he's, I think, had 100 days in his job right now. He's kind of reflecting on what he's heard. He did a listening tour as well. And he wrote that, um, that it makes really good sense for organizations here to find new ways to work together collaboratively to solve problems and address regional challenges. And it was very heartening to, for me personally, and I think as our value our future, to hear Kirk say that. That was one of the big things he's heard during his first 100, 100 days. Which brings me to your roles. So I wanted to kind of go over, um, some of this is kind of boilerplate, but um, the role of lead and supporting partners. Um, when I talk to, to most of you to convince you to commit to leading or supporting an action item or game changer, um, you know, it's pretty apparent that you guys are either doing this work already, starting to do the work, or planning to do the work, or think of the action item or game changer as a really good idea and something that you want to pursue. Our definition, this is our Valley or Futures definition of a um, of a partnering organization is an organization that can be public, private, nonprofit that has accepted responsibility for facilitating, championing, and seeing to fruition the implementation of an action item or a game changer. Um, how you how you get started on that? Um, in one of your handouts today, I think it was maybe on the top of your when you got into your chair. There is a list of um, contacts for every single lead partner divided by focus area. And um, I also will send you a PDF of this list um, either later today or tomorrow. Um, so the key is to communicate and collaborate, right? Um, with your code lead and supporting partners. So this you know, can be simple as get things going, send an email, pick up the phone. You know, today if you see somebody that you know is a code or supporting lead partner, talk to them, you know, just kind of get things going. Just to get things rolling, that's the key. Start to act on things. Um, also, I wanted to point out that this is um, the starting point. So we want you to stick to the general intent of each action item and game changer, because that's what residents told us they want to see happen here. But action items can evolve. So um, if you feel like, as you get into it, the description of your action item doesn't quite fit, maybe needs to be changed a little bit, please contact me and we'll talk about it. Um, we've done this in the past with the first action plan. You know, things evolve. 
maybe they don't evolve this year, but maybe you get next year. Things are different. You want to change things. Um, we also reproduce the action plan every year, so we update it at the end of the year. So we can update the description for the next year. Um, you can also bring other organizations not listed currently um, into the fold. You know, if you think somebody is, you really need another organization to make this thing fly, then reach out to them, bring them on the fold, bring, bring them in. Uh, the big thing is just to act, act on these. Um, once the action plan is released, um, our Valley, our future reverts to serving as a convener, organizer, facilitator, like we're doing today. Uh, we can also do it for smaller meetings and groups, uh, data collector and communicator for all your partnering organizations. Um, if you have a need again, we can facilitate meetings. Um, we did that a lot the first during the first five years of the first action plan. Uh, we'll communicate successful outcomes. We have a pretty large e-news subscriber list, social media, um, press releases, relationship with the media here. We also do some data collection. Um, these surveys and reports are on, published on our website. Um, and later today, you'll hear some more about using that information to your benefit. Um, we, for instance, just concluded a large regional housing survey where we had more than 1,500 residents complete that. And that's gonna be published later this week. Um, a lot of great information in there. There were 30 questions in that survey. Time frame, um, the, action game, the action plan covers the years 2022 through 2026. Uh, a lead partner does not have to start necessarily work on it this year. I mean, we encourage that, um, but it's a five-year plan. Um, also, but keep in mind that the fact that it's in this action plan is a sign that residents are clamoring for that. So keep that in mind, too. And then finally, um, at the end of each year, um, I will send you uh, an online form, or I'll, I'll send you a link to an online form that asks you about the progress of action items, outcomes achieved, and this is, there's only about four or five questions, it won't take you about 10 minutes to complete. It's just our way of to kind of check in and kind of see how things are going. With that, um, yeah, with that, I'd like to introduce now our next two presenters, um, Laura, Laura Gloria, who's the City of Wenatchee's Executive Services, Services Director, um, who also serves as Our Valley, Our Futures Board President. And then um, after Laura, Mickey Fleming, the Lands Program Manager with the Chelan Douglas Land Trust is gonna get up. And they're both gonna be talking about how you all, as lead and supporting partners, can utilize OVOF and the action plan in your funding requests. Laura? lots of municipalities and uh, other organizations do plans and sometimes we don't get to implement them there's not enough funding there's not enough capacity but funding is always the big piece and so uh, the city has been really successful in using the RL or future plan to apply for grants and receive those grants and so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about that so um, I'll use an example something that we're actually working on right now so uh, Riverfront Park, which is the lovely park that's right behind you, uh, we partnered with the PUD to do a planning study, a master plan study, that cost about $320,000. Um, over the last six to eight months, we worked with a landscape architect to engage stakeholders, put together workshops, do surveys, so we can get a plan, right? Um, to then go ahead and implement. Um, so that, again, big effort in terms of cost, in terms of time. Um, but that plan then allows us to go to start to look to implement those phases. So now that we have the master plan, we can start looking at what available funding is there, apply for grants. Um, the city does apply for grants all the time. Lincoln Park right now is fairly under construction and I want to hold the, uh, the budget on that one and we've got about a million dollars of the city's general fund, but there's Waste, uh, wild, wildlife and recreational parks grants, there's youth athletic facilities grants, totaling $600,000, and so those pay, pay for uh, uh, equipment, uh, 
the basketball courts, all of those kind of amenities that go on the park. Um, so that's kind of what we're getting ready on Riverfront Park. Now we're implementing the plan and looking for grant funding. And so when you go to apply for grants, they really are requiring you to show community buy-in. These, these programs, these state programs, especially, especially federal programs, they really want you to show that the community is invested and that their investment is going to survive and, and, and not have a ton of issues, that it's going to be implementable. Um, so to get to that point, um, you really have to be able to show, again, um, the success of that from the, from the community standpoint. So. Um, that's, I think, sort of the trajectory of where this action plan really fits in, is that this is not just a singular plan for Riverfront Park or Lincoln Park, which are all great projects on their own, but this is a plan that has, I think, 86 action items, I counted, that have all been kind of already have that community outreach, already have the focus groups and the stakeholders, all of that work has already been done so that you can, in essence, take that work and go and apply for a grant or a certain program and, and check that box, and not only check that box, but do a really good job of saying, look at all of this work that went into this plan. Um, I was actually on a call last week for a Building for the Arts grant program, and uh, typically what you can do is you can, to show community support, is you can provide letters of support. So you can say, here's our grant application, and we have these 10 letters of support from all of these different agencies, and Sometimes we use a template because it helps. That's a little bit quicker, so everyone has the same template and you all sign your agency names and that's been successful in the past. Um, but they said, don't do that anymore. That, that won't score well with us. Um, and in fact, what they're doing now is they're sending out a survey to like your, your supporting agencies. And so if you have a grant application, they will send you a survey link, that person will take it. And so you get more kind of unique responses every time. Um, so having something like this, again, is just another opportunity to say we've done the work and look at all of the buy and look at all of the agencies. Um, because not only are these grant programs requiring more of that, but they're requiring more of that genuine community and stakeholder buy-in. Um, so, and that means, you know, bigger successes. So last year, the city received $92 million for a federal infra grant program, and that's an infrastructure program. Um, a big piece of that was we had the Our Valley, Our Future logo right on the front page along with the city of Wenatchee's logo, uh, you know, uh, Chelan County, Douglas County, East Wenatchee, the, the Transportation Council. So it really showed that cohesive approach and we were really able to speak to all the parts about why this is going to be successful in the community and who you've talked to and and it was an action item that was right in, in the action plan. It was complete the Apple Capital Loop Trail. Um, so we got $92 million for that. Um, I think Mickey can talk about some other successes in similar ways. Um, and it works uh, for all different kinds of grants, implementation grants. Um, I actually was speaking to uh, uh, someone in our utility department who's writing grants for wastewater systems and our, and our sewer systems and whatnot, and she was applying for a, a planning grant. So what a planning grant is, I have an idea, I'd like to plan, and I'd like you to help me with that money. Um, the questions in there, I guess, were kind of asking about outcomes, and, and she thought, well, that's what I'm asking for money for, so I need that now, to, so I can actually do that work. Um, so I thought that was really interesting that even the planning grants are getting really detailed as to what they're asking for. And so again, something like this really says, all right, here's the idea, and again, there's, there's all these outcomes as to uh, the community-wide outcomes that someone can speak to really easily in a planning grant, really just copy-paste. That's what I do, just, I mean, Steve already did a great job writing it, so don't do it again. Um, but yeah, so again, this has just been a really easy way to be able to support that grant, save some funding, save some staff time and capacity, and be really successful. So, that's all to Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> I keep finding the lands program manager with the land trust. Um, real quick, I wanted to kind of follow up with what Laura just mentioned, and that is um, well, when we did the outreach work in 2021, we got more than 2,000 people. I've got a huge database of information in the cross tab, et cetera. 
And I'll just give you a couple of examples, like the city of Indiana is here today in the chamber. Um, there was a lot of folks in Indiana who completed the survey. I can provide you that information. I can take that out and give that to you. Hispanic Business Council is here today. We had, of the more than 2,000, we had, I think 26% of the respondents self-identified as Latino. I've got all that information. I can provide you that um, when you do grant requests or funding requests. Uh, Mickey? All right. Can you all hear me okay with the mask? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. I just came back from a family funeral in Florida and I feel like I've been exposed to so many people. I'm trying to be as safe as possible. So, as Steve said, I'm with the Land Trust. I've been with the Land Trust almost 14 years. My job is um, working with landowners who are interested in conserving their property, either with selling it outright or with conservation easements. Uh, with then doing the deals, getting funding for the transactions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Land Trust has been around for 37 years, which is a wonderful thing. Started, you know, back in 85. Get the mic closer. Oh yeah, that's better. Isn't it? <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, you know, working to conserve and steward natural places in our area of Chelan and Douglas counties and provide public access. We're compatible with those objectives. Hannah Beener, who's here, uh, is our trails director and is in charge of that public access component, which we always consider in part of our project. And although we do lots of different habitats, we have quite a lot of uh, land in the Antioch watersheds and the Wenatchee watersheds, which we protect largely for salmon recovery purposes and ecological function. We have Douglas County property where a large objective is sage grouse and allowing continuing agricultural compatible use. Certainly most of what the land trust is known for in the valley here, oh Lisa, I didn't see you here too. And Lisa Lopez, who works both with us and Team Matt Lisa, um, is the, the front country trail system, right? Which started in the Wenatchee foothills. And um, uh, a lot of when we saw we talked to to the general public it's about why we do what we do why we do the conservation uh, and so forth what we're talking about here and it's very well de described there is kind of how we do it right the nuts and bolts of getting getting the whole thing done and i just want to emphasize how important as she said having a plan like this that is both durable and living right that it keeps moving on the land trust work in the front country, if you will, trail system, really started with its first plan in 2004-05. I wasn't here yet, but it was what they called the Trails Charette uh, that involved the city and a number of other partners, the Complete the Loop Coalition, lots of folks then. But you look at that document, it had a map, um, it had access points, the idea that this could all eventually be more or less connected. And we've been working on that ever since. That was supplemented with the land trust in the city and the county, primarily, trust for public land. Working on the Foothills Community Strategy in 1011, again, as Steve said, involving lots of people in the community. And literally, now, in 2005, 17 years later, we are still working on implementing that original vision the next one, and each one as it, it involves. So I say about all these things, it takes 20 years. <laughs> and you have to develop that vision and that intent and then keep at it and keep checking back in with your community and so forth. So that's a bit more of the why. And in the implementation, uh, as was described, when you're going for public money, you have to show them that the public was involved in developing this vision and that they agree with what you're planning to do. And that is why having these plans, having that data that Steve just described, that is gold for you when you go to apply for grants. Uh, most of these properties in the foothills, and I can kind of go through them south to north, but have been implemented in one way or another through public funding. I don't know if you're familiar with the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Program. 
<clears throat> but that's something that the legislature funds through its capital funding program every two years. And so every two years, we and municipalities and every municipality, Wenatchee, Eniat, Leavenworth, et cetera, uh, would have the, have the opportunity to apply in these grant categories. And they range from trails to habitat conservation, water access, you name it, they have a lot of categories. But in all those cases, those are 50% funding. So the maximum you can get is 50%, at least for us. And you need to be able to bring match money, which land trust generally does through community donations from all our wonderful members of the community like you. Uh, but you also need to show everything that has been said here that the community supports this project. And so when we submitted two projects this year, actually one with the city as a sponsor, we asked the state for a letter of support from our Valley, our future. And it, of course, went to the sustainable environment objective. And we have front country trails and public access and so forth as objectives in there. And that's really our, our primary goal with this group. But we're able to show, again, that it's continuing ongoing support from that perspective of compatible recreation and conservation, as well as, you know, we also get letters of support about mule deer and, and all the, and from the plant, Native Plant Society and all that sort of thing. And that's what you need in order to build your funding for these programs. And it's amazing what we can do. I put the numbers together recently, actually, and we have gotten about $10 million from the state, which means from us as taxpayers, right, to support uh, public funding portion of these foothills projects. So thank you all, and let's keep doing it. Before I call out our next two presenters, uh, Nikki brought up a good point. Letters of support. I do a lot of letter support, and lead partners, um, you know, ask me um, for putting in a funding request. Um, I try to personalize these as much as I can with data, again, and so it isn't just this boilerplate letter of support. Um, I try to add at least a graph or two um, that gives it something extra. Um, one. Um, one little warning, you have to give me at least two or three weeks um, to do these um, because it takes some time and I've got to get my board to sign off on these before I send them back to you. So, um, but I'm glad to do that for you. Um, I'd now like to introduce um, John Chapman, uh, North Central Accountable Communities of Health's um, Executive Director, and Carolyn Tillier, uh, ACH's Director of Strategy and Community Integration. They're going to come on. And we've got a slideshow that I'm going to go to here in a second. They're going to discuss a uh, funding program they have that um, um, you guys I think are going to be very interested in. So, um, Caroline and John, can come up. That would be great. gets this up and running. Just a quick little bit of background of North Central ACH since some of you may know us, some of us, some of you may not. We've been around in the region for about oh, six or seven years, started as a pilot program through the Washington State Healthcare Authority and the state legislature. And really, for a lot of you, you've probably thought of us or heard of us over the last five years focused on health care improvement and quality improvement work. And that was a lot of our focus, but really, um, we've made a lot of shift over these last few years as we focused on where our value is to our region and what we can do moving forward. Uh, similar to what our value, our future does, we kind of do that at a more regional level. In Chelan, it was Grant and Okanagan County. Um, so we are building our partnership with Steve and our Valley, our future, because you guys really do this at a local level and instead of trying to duplicate what you guys do, we're really looking at how we support and collaborate our efforts. So you can see our mission statement up here. This was changed over a few years ago. And really what I like to focus and call out is our mission is focused on whole person health and health equity. So that includes all components of health 
and how we make health equitable for all members in our community. And that's a change from that healthcare focus, right? Because health, whole person health really includes more than just healthcare. And then you can see how we're really driving that in our mission statement by bringing stakeholders together, collaborating, and driving systemic change, which I'm looking in this room right now, and I think that just summed up what all of you guys are doing in this room right now. And that demonstrates that alignment. Knowing that it's a broad mission, you can see some of our focus areas up here. So we're still really a health focus agency. Next slide. Uh, so to call a few things out again, like I want to call out some of the definitions up here. So when you think of whole person health, again, I really want you to get past that term health and always tie into healthcare, physical health, or even behavioral health. But it's really all things that drive and influence a person's health um, across the spectrum of their life. Also, I want to also call out health equity. So as we move into the new uh, and the work that we're doing in the future, we always want to ensure that that health and the way that we do the change is equitable for our community. One of the things that we're really focused on as, a, as an organization is ensuring that it is community informed and community driven. So that, again, a lot of what Steve has done in the survey work and a lot of what you guys have done is really demonstrate not how three people have come together and said this is great for our community, but how you've really brought the community together to say this is what's needed and this is how we're gonna drive change and that's what we're gonna support. I'm not gonna go into the social determinants of health. You can read that and you've all heard this term over and over. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So to really give us some focus for 2022, um, we have identified five strategic priorities for our organization. And really when it comes down to it, we'll go into these in a little bit more detail. So those five priorities have underneath it things that we as an organization are supporting the community on and funding opportunities we have available for partners to come in and support achieving those priorities. A lot of our funding um, that we've been able to get is through contracts and partnerships with the Washington State Healthcare Authority, again, focused on some of the work we've done but it's been very flexible in how we are able to deliver and partner to utilize those funds. And that's why we're able to really bring this kind of opportunity forward. Uh, next slide. So one opportunity, um, and this is probably coming the end of July, so I apologize, I'm sharing it now, and I'm gonna ask you to keep your eyes out for it for a few weeks, um, is we, one of our strategic priorities is really to develop a culture of equity and community resilience. And so we are doing this internally by trying to lead an example of building that culture of equity with our board, with our organization, and how we partner with people. But we are also, we also recognize that we don't have all the answers and that there are a lot of words out there that we don't connect with. And so we are gonna be releasing funding in July, uh, 500,000 for organizations who are focused on building a culture of equity in their community really for those individuals who are fighting for belonging and inclusion. So ideally what we're really looking for is community-led, community-driven work that's really building that culture of equity, not just saying we're gonna benefit a few additional people here or there, but how are we making that change in our community and how are we influencing partners around the community to make that change. I will fill you know the disclaimer is when we get this out rolling, always read the funding principles and don't quote me here because each one has a little bit of details in there that might, might be a little bit more specific. Okay, and I'm going to turn this over to Carol. Take the baton. Good morning, everybody. Um, a couple, actually three more funding opportunities that we wanted to share. We worked with Steve to figure out what might be in alignment with some of the action items in the plan, so that's what we're sharing today. Um, and just as a reminder, our board is really committed to making sure that all the funds you see on these slides are going equitably to Okanagan, Chelan, Douglas, and Grant. So we definitely want you to be aware of the funds so that they can help grease the wheel of your action plans, but know that it's going to have to kind of be spread across a larger region. So this funding opportunity just was released, and if you have any follow-up questions, you can actually reach out to me. My email's on the slide. Um, it's designed to increase cross-sector collaborations with kind of a specific focus, which is to promote coordinated, coordinated whole system responses. And if that sounds a little wonky to you, there are some definitions of what we mean by that in the application. 
Um, so it's not just about cross-sector partnerships, like one organization partnering with a couple of others. It's really about trying to figure out what system is not working well, how is it fragmented and not working for residents, and how could we make it work better. And just, so if you have thoughts about how to do that that are in alignment with the action plan, definitely take, take a look at that um, application and reach out to me if you have any questions. We're totally happy to talk through questions to, to check for fit so that you don't waste your time on an application that ends up kind of being a little bit off what we had intended. So definitely reach out for that. But I think there are definitely things in the action plan that are in line, aligned with this uh, funding opportunity. The next one is um, something I wanted to mention. It's actually, there's a behavioral health worker, but I know several of you in the room today have been participating in that. They've been meeting since February. There's actually a full day meeting right now, today at the CTC. And it's a group of regional partners that are involved in our behavioral health system that are trying to figure out how to make that system work better. And they are actually kind of in charge of shaping how we invest those $1.5 million across our four county region. But Wendy did let me know that it's probably there's probably going to be some funds that were allocated that will be free and flexible for other efforts. And so if you have ideas, I believe behavioral health is called out in the action plan as well. And if you want to talk to Wendy a little bit about how to align with what this behavioral health work group has been doing, definitely reach out to her um, and explore your, your ideas and solutions. Um, next slide, this last one is telehealth. Again, this was mentioned in the action plan, so we're calling it out. Um, we actually did some assessments last year with um, healthcare and other partners across our four county region. I think in Chelan Douglas, I'm pretty sure that CBCH, the Center for Alcohol and Drug Treatment, and Lake Chelan Health participated in assessments which means that they're then able to kind of work on their, their planning and they will be able to tap into these funds to uh, increase telehealth access. So if you have any additional ideas that you think are worth funding as part of your action plan, again, you can reach out to Wendy. So the point of us being here today is just to make sure you knew that there, there are resources available to move your solutions forward. And we're going to continue to talk and coordinate with Steve so we stay aligned. And then you're welcome to reach out to any of us to talk about anything at any time. So I don't know if we have time for questions, Steve, but you're probably on your time crunch. So can you tell us what? OK. Thank you all. Just quickly, the other comment I would say is if you saw things up here and you always want to have a conversation, you don't need to just reach out to us with the funding. Um, we are always happy to connect, share what we're doing, and share best practices across the region. So I encourage you guys just to reach out to us if you're curious for more. Yeah, email up here, and you can go to ncach.org for our phone numbers. Thank you, John and Carolyn. Um, I wanted to follow up uh, something that Carolyn mentioned about the cross collaboration, or cross sector collaborations at fund. Um, one of the great things that happened, I guess, this year with the action plan was uh, there was a major cross-cutting theme of resilience. A lot of folks told us, and this probably was somewhat related to the pandemic, but they, we heard from a lot of people that they wanted to see the community build up greater resilience. Um, doesn't matter whether that was health, you know, wildfires, or um, education. I mean, they really want to see us. And so that theme is throughout the action plan. Many of the projects and programs have that resilience theme to them, and that really does ma match up well with um, what Carolyn mentioned a moment ago about um, how that fund, that cross-sector collaboration fund, is meant to kind of build up systems. So um, keep that in mind when you um, look over this information. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about a... Um, Our Valley, our future itself has a, um, I guess you'd call a small grants program um, with the assistance of the Community Foundation, which administers it. Um, we award micro grants um, to lead partners for action items in the plan. Uh, this money is meant to get um, projects going, or maybe in some cases across the finish line. Um, but again, these are small micro grants. Um, 
I wanted to give you an example or a few examples of organizations that have received these grants in the past. They include uh, organizations like the Cascadia Conservation District, uh, which used the micro grant in turn to apply for and receive another $25,000 grant uh, for youth outdoor education programs. Uh, we gave a grant to the Housing Solutions Group, the Shalane Douglas Housing Solutions Group. They used it to hire a consultant to write a, to write a white paper researching why home construction costs are so high in the Wenatchee area. The Housing Authority in turn used that white paper to help it receive a $6 million grant uh, for housing. Um, Transportation Council used a grant to create a map of bike routes and trails in the community that was then printed and distributed. Uh, the Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance used a grant to complete the last, I think it was two or three miles at Squirrel Chuck State Park. Uh, Wenatchee Valley College used one of our grants to launch a Spanish language business startup program. And finally, uh, Sustainable NCW um, used uh, one of our grants to launch their community education program. So again, these are small grants, but they can be very valuable in the work you're doing. The next application deadline says October 1st here, but it should say August 1st. Um, and so um, you can go to apply. There's the address right there. If you go to the Community Foundation website, you can find it too by clicking on a bunch of links. But um, there's the actual address right there. Um, anyway, so I wanted to let you guys know that um, that's something else you can you can utilize as a as a lead partner. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce um, now Alan Walker, um, who's executive director of the Shawan Douglas Community Action Council. He's also an R Valley Our Future board member and is uh, one of the founders of R Valley Our Future. Um, when it was first known as, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, it wasn't R Valley Our Future at first. It was called. Our Valley, What's Next? And we ran with that name for about a, a year and a half or two years, and then once the first action plan came out, we reverted to our current name. So Alan, uh, why don't you come on up and talk about how we can utilize the action plan and planning work. Yes, thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Yes, we started in the fall of 2014 as a challenge put out by Frontier Communications. Uh, America's Best Cities uh, was, the, was the challenge that they put out. And there's still a few of us uh, dinosaurs around that were part of that uh, process almost eight years ago now. So uh, some of you, one of the things that I think is fascinating about this whole process, and you've heard it this morning from a variety of different voices, is how to use the action plan to better your organization, but really to better our communities as a whole. And that's one of the key driving points behind this entire process, is how do we make this a better place for all of us? And one of the things that, as a community action council, we are charged with doing every three years is a community needs assessment. So, Washington State Department of Commerce receives federal funding, community service block development grant, CSBG, and one of the requirements to receive that funding is we have to provide them with a community needs assessment updated every three years. Well, this is a huge undertaking. And so we did the last one uh, just three years ago, coming up on three and a half years ago, we wrapped it up. We actually contracted with Steve Bomber to help us with that community needs assessment. And when we were looking at redoing it again this year, we started looking at the action plan going, well, a lot of the stuff that's deep uncovered from our community and from our folks groups with the needs assessment are in the action plan as well. So we went to the Department of Commerce and said, hey, you know, it's expensive to do this needs assessment every three years. There's another entity here, which they were familiar with, because we've shared with them the, action, the previous action plan, and said, can we use the Our Valley, Our Future action plan as an update, a tool for our needs assessment to help us as an organization identify community needs and what we need to address. And guess what? They said yes. So all of a sudden, we are taking a burden off of not only our staff and our organization and the cost associated with doing this, but the burden off our community and the members of our community by coming to them one more time with another survey saying, please fill this out. 
We don't have to do that. We're taking that burden off of all of us, and especially off our community members. So think about that. I know there are several in this room. The action plan is a community needs assessment. There's another term for the action plan, another term that you've heard multiple different ways it's been explained this morning. And so just think about that as you're moving forward. And if your funders or your organizations are requiring a needs assessment, think about what's in the action plan. What, there's 140 or something like that, different things listed in there, 80 some uh, game changers. There is a tremendous amount of information and input that has been gathered already from our region. So think a little bit about how you can use that moving forward. Um, one of the things I would also like to mention that we tie in not only with uh, the R Valley Action Plan, but is also the Chelan Douglas Trends data. So the Chelan Douglas Trends uh, is supported by Eastern Washington University. Uh, began about six, seven years ago, if my memory is correct. I could be off on that just a little bit. But it has 170 indicators, I believe, data points about our region. Uh, primarily Chelan and Douglas County, because it's the Chelan and Douglas County trends. But they also do it for Grant County, and they also do it for Okanagan County, they being Eastern Washington University. So between our Valley, our future action plan, the Chelan and Douglas trends, we are able to really pull information from both of those data points. Uh, we write, I don't know, 50 or 60 grants a year, and it's wealth of information at your fingertips. So keep both of those in mind. And I'll turn it back over to, oh, Laura, is Laura coming up next? Yeah. Oh, you're going to Thank you, Alan. Um, what I'm going to do now, we've got some time. Um, I'm going to have Laura, Gloria, come back up, and she's going to kind of lead this discussion. Um, we really want to hear from folks here. Uh, we've gone over a lot of stuff this morning, and you guys, you know, we've been around now since 2014, as Alan mentioned. Um, we really want to hear from folks about what we can do better. Um, what what do you guys still need from us? And I'm going to hand the mic off to um, Laura, and then I'm going to grab the other mic um, and go into the audience with um, with that. All right. Uh, so I think when Steve sent out the email um, with some of the information for today's meeting, he also kind of included a question: What can we do better? Um, I think this is the first time we've held this lead partners meeting. I think in the past, as Steve mentioned, it was more conversations. So this was an effort to try to get everyone in the same room to start to connect faces with organizations and um, especially with uh, any game changer items or action items that you may be working on. And so uh, the contact list was also an idea that we came up with to, again, you may not know someone at a different organization who's also in the lead partner group that you may be in. And so really easy way to say that's, that's my person. That's who I need to reach out to. So that being said, I'm sure there may be some things we may be missing. So, um, any thoughts, ideas, questions? If you raise your hand, I'll come over and uh, hand you the microphone. And then he'll answer it too. Here, we got a question. <laughs> Hi, hopefully this is in line with what you guys are thinking. Um, one of the questions that I had with the action plan and when we're talking about grants and data and demonstration of effectiveness, the metric piece I think is one that's been a challenge for me. So when we say, you know, we did this project, what does that actually mean? Um, so what is the either, what is the measurable, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, of these projects being completed? So that when we want to use that kind of data, um, is there thoughts around how to do that or you know, an approach maybe we can kind of think about how we measure the progress and what does completion actually mean? Maybe I should ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, we use the trends, trying to those trends. We have some of our um, focus areas that are attached to uh, demographics in that. And so um, we did that. The pandemic created some issues, obviously. Because what it did to the economy and basically our livability. And so um, there was about a two-year gap there. The other thing that we measure is, um, I mentioned earlier the survey that we, we hand out, or the online form we hand out at the end of the year to kind of figure out um, which action items have had successful outcomes. And this is where we measure things. Um, we also uh, take note of um, 
in that online survey or online form. We also take note of um, a lot of the stuff you've heard today about how folks have been able to generate additional funding um, because of that. So um, it's a hard one to kind of really, you know, um, buttonhole, I think, with metrics because of what it, what it actually is. Um, and we've been discussing further about how to, how to kind of tie that to indicators and metrics that really mean something. Um, I mentioned a moment ago the Schlein Douglas trends, you know, we use that, but it's, um, it's difficult to prove that a particular action item or maybe even a game changer, you know, impacted or had a role in something successful, right, um, when it comes to t statistics. So it's a difficult one. Does that answer your question? Sort of? We'll talk more. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I think Brooklyn's point is a really good one of what what are the outcomes and the metrics? Is there are we seeing changes in uh, you know high school graduation rates or you know things that are also definable so that you can say what's been successful and how you're going to continue to use that information? So I think that's something that we just need to think and talk about more. I think Carl uh, Mayor Carl has a question. Actually, that's not a question. It's actually a comment on something that I think you've done really right, and that is the last one that I guess my criticism, and I was open with that, was that even though it says our valley, it was really centered around Wenatchee East Wenatchee, and it really didn't expand that collaboration through the whole valley. Yeah. And I think, you know, you've done so much better on this go round and represented here are the number I know from the upper valley and we're at the housing as well and I think that's a critical piece moving forward because these problems housing fire resilience the fire issues the, you know the environmental all of those ones that transportation are all regional and are going to take us all working together and so I really appreciate the steps you've taken in that. So it's not a criticism, it's a thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I think um, actually the pandemic led a little bit to that too in order in, in having Zoom meetings and being able to do a lot of outreach in these outlying areas that maybe Steve, the, our line coordinator, didn't have the capacity to go out there and do, but we want to be able to do that. It's just been a matter of, of time and, and capacity and hopefully with all of the different agencies here at the table, including yourself today, Mayor Flory, is having you participate and kind of being those nodes of information and connection back to that main vision is really important in continuing to drive that ongoing uh, addition and interest. Yeah, our connection to uh, the other communities outside Wenatchee and West Wenatchee is definitely growing. The housing survey that I mentioned a moment or earlier, well, you know, more than 1,500 people and of that number, about 18% um, were from the Upper Valley, from uh, Kashmir on up, and so that's a really good number. It gives you the idea of how we're, um, people know who we are now up there. Uh, Schland Manson, I think it was seven or 8% of the survey respondents were from up there, so uh, NTAD has been really good lately. Uh, also, when we did our, um, we did some focus groups, virtual focus groups in 2021, in these communities, they were just for these communities, and um, those were extremely well attended. Um, uh, Leavenworth, Indiana, Waterville, Waterville. There was like 20 people, you know, showed up in this thing, and, and so um, people definitely are, are participating. And, and that was one of the shortcomings, I think, of the first action plan was that it was very much um, greater Wenatchee centric. Any other thoughts, or questions, or comments? So I do have a question. Um, Mina Gomez, I'm the chair for the Hispanic Business Council, and I think that with nonprofits, one of the problems that we find is that we don't have a grant writer, if you will. Um, is there someone that you guys might have on your team of VOF that might be able to help when it comes to grant writing that are focused and centered around some of these action items that we want in our community? So it's more of an ask, sorry, not really a question. Thank you. We, we don't, that's something we've looked at before, and yeah. um, we're kind of thinking about it right now. I do know that the Community Foundation and also, I believe accountable community health have discussed this. 
um, about trying to hire a grant, grant writer for um, nonprofits in the region. It is a big issue, and you've got to have certain expertise to be able to write grants and successful grant applications. Uh, the tricky part is um, if you offer something like that, you, that person is going to get probably bombarded. Um, and then how do you decide, you know, um, which ones to do? And you know, it's, it's a, and then there's also the, the, you know, to have a real successful grant, you need really good information from that organization, and sometimes. If you have a grant writer, that doesn't necessarily happen. So, but it is an issue, and we've heard that from a lot of uh, nonprofits. Um, but the Community Foundation is definitely looking at it right now because we we talked to them recently about that. I, I would also encourage you to see if some of these grants that are available could you be used to pay for a grant writer. Um, you know, I know that there are several grant writing. Um, we hired someone for the Africa Capital Loop uh, project who was who wrote the entire thing and worked, of course, with the different agencies and collecting, but uh, she put in a lot of work to, to get that, and, and understanding the program is very important. You know, she had done a ton of federal programs, and so understanding what they want to hear, how they want to hear it, what types of metrics are important, what are not, and so having an experienced grant holder that's both experienced with your agency, but then also understands the programmatic side, and so uh, maybe one grant writer isn't the most feasible, but if there's funding out there to pay for a grant writer as a kind of a consultant type thing, I think that would be something that potentially some of our programs could fund. Just on that topic of grant writing, I think that it might be worth looking into um, kind of tapping some folks in our nonprofit organizations who might be interested in learning how to write grants better um, and kind of develop it that way, maybe bring in some experts to train us locally how to do that. Um, that feels like a little bit more sustainable approach, and I would sign up for that in a heartbeat. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Any other comments, questions? Guess what? It's right around 10 o'clock. Perfect. So um, I want to thank everybody who is not a lead or supporting partner of a Game Changer Initiative for coming this morning. Um, it's not up there, but uh, the Art Valley Art Feature, um, thank you, Laura. Um, email address is info at rvalleyartfuture.org. Um, I think it's actually on the back of the here, but the action plan, you can find it there. If you have any um, needs, uh, contact me. Um, any questions, contact me. Um, if you need help, you know, in organizing, meeting, facilitating, communicating something, we're, we're able to do that.